For a significant portion of my 30s, I have been trying to fix my 2005 CL65 AMG. And it seems like every time I fix something on this car, something else breaks. And most people, as they get older, have normal goals like paying off a car loan or maybe saving for retirement. But for me, it's a little different. My only goal is to fix this car completely before I turn 40 years old. And I'm happy to say that right now I'm 39 and I think, I think I've gotten somewhere with this car. Check this out. All right, so if you guys have been following along the videos, you know that what I'm battling right now is an issue where when I go wide open throttle for like more than two or three seconds, it goes into a limp mode and the check engine light starts to flash. And I've done a ton to try to remedy this issue. And check this out. <laughs> it burns the tires. Oh my gosh, it rips guys, it rips. And you know, something I guess I hadn't thought about a lot in the last few videos was I was flooring this car and it basically wasn't really spinning the tires. I was kind of tricking myself into thinking that it was just as fast off the line as it would normally be. And then it would just kick you out. And I was just mostly focused on that whole limp mode thing. We just did that in no limp mode. I mean, we're still good. I don't have to pull over and shut the car off. It is effortless now. Oh my gosh. This thing is awesome. So you might be wondering, Alex, what has changed? What did you do to this thing? And super long story short, it was the tune. So I've had the tuning twins out here for a few nights, probably eight hours total of digging in to this ancient computer that not many people have any experience with. So the tuning twins are tuning my Eclipse GSX and they tune six second GTRs and Lambos. They saw my videos, they saw my struggles and said, Alex, you know, we don't have personal experience with this computer, but can we come by and just dig deep? And I did have a base tune on the CL from a very reputable tuner that was overseas, but the big issue was getting data back and forth and modifying the tune. It really just needed someone to log this live and then make a revision. So the tuning twins, I mean, they probably uploaded like 12 or 15 different tune revisions to this car to get it to the point where we're at right now and it's still not boosting as much as it should. So once I do a bunch of checks, which we're gonna get into right now, and I make sure 100% that this thing is good for the dyno, uh, we're gonna meet them at the dyno, and we're gonna continue tuning, raise the boost, and we'll talk more in detail on what was going on here. But basically the issue was, is that with the upgraded turbos, fuel system, and the ported heads, this car was making a lot more power, and there were torque limiters in the engine's computer. There was a lot that went into this. I mean, you should have seen them pulling up the tune. It was like the Matrix, a lot of it was in German. We're gonna see that, it's gonna be really cool. But yeah, essentially this car needs a live tuner. These V12s are just very rare. There's only like 100 60 of these cars. So anyway, we have a bunch of things to check over. Hopefully nothing else breaks on the car. I got to get it hundred percent before we hit the dyno next week with the tuning twins. Let's get to work. So we're going to be doing a pre-dyno prep and inspection. And something I want to look into is boost leaks, because like I said, we're at about 14 PSI right now. We should be at about 20 and it should hold solid with those bigger turbos. So to check for boost leaks, all you really need is some baby oil. You better hide your baby oil. And we're gonna pour it inside of a paint can and soak up this wick right here. And if you guys have no idea what's going on right now, that wouldn't be the weirdest thing in the world. But this is what we call a very budget smoke tester machine. I'll show you how it works, it's pretty cool. So I have done a smoke test before to check for vacuum leaks and I didn't have any, but I am not taking any chances at all before this dyno at Cannonball Garage with the tuning twins. That's the thing when you're going to a dyno, you just, you don't wanna waste anybody's time, especially the tuners. There we go, air box is out. And we're gonna loosen up our intercoolers, pull them up. We gotta block off the throttle body. And a plastic Y piece. Of course, I'm working on this super hot. That's always fun. There we 
There we go. Okay, that's all. So I'm gonna smoke test the intercoolers, but I wanna isolate the intake manifold right now and concentrate our smoke there. I'm gonna use a trusty blue rubber glove. So we have to feed our smoke tester power from a battery. Now it's gonna heat up that baby oil. We'll give it some air pressure. And this is regulated down and we should get smoke pretty quick. It starts off light. This isn't good enough. Just wait a few more minutes. So while our baby oil is heating up, I have to get prepared for our dyno trip because it's 45 minutes each way. And you know, I don't go anywhere without my Fantic tire inflator and my Fantic jump pack. And Fantic just came out with the ultimate tire inflator, their X9. Ultra, let me show you this thing. The X9 Ultra is a three-in-one device, so not only does it fill tires quickly and within one PSI of accuracy, but it can charge your devices too. It comes with three outlets that you can use at the same time, including a USB port and two USB-C outlets, with one pumping out up to 65 watts. The X9 also has a super powerful and bright light with three different modes. This is huge if you're on a camping trip or working on your rig in the evening. So the X9 works for everybody, but it was specifically designed for you off-road truck, Jeep type of guys. So check it out. We have a totally flat 35 inch tire and this comes with a 45 inch long hose. This is awesome. And check this out. This has four memory modes so you can set these and forget them. <laughs> So it'll fill this gigantic tire in just a few minutes, and it has enough battery power to do all four, even if they were all totally flat. So that means you can use this thing dozens of times in the more common situation where you just need to top it up or adjust pressure when you're off-roading. The battery is gigantic. All right, so we're done. Tire is totally full, and we have a full battery still. Like I gotta say, this thing is seriously awesome. Then when you're done, this just folds up very easily in the bottom, just like that for storage, and you have your accessories inside so you can fill up balls or anything else that you might need a different style fitting for. And I just wanna show you that the X9 is really light and super compact. You can put this into any car. It's about the same width as a hoverboard, for comparison. Now I'm gonna leave you an Amazon link for the X9 down below with a code to get you a massive limited time discount. Every time I show Fantic products, the discount is so good that most of them sell out. So if you guys are interested in this, you gotta act quickly. And of course, I'll link a bunch of other awesome Fantic products that I use. I've been using them for about two or three years now. They're all phenomenal. So those will all be down below. Get yourself one of these X9s. You won't regret it. It is amazing. And with that, Let's get back to the CL. This is the kind of smoke I'm talking about. You're ready to go at this point. So we're gonna feed the smoke into the engine and we should see our glove get bigger. I'm gonna kind of help hold it on here too. You can put a clamp around here or a zip tie or something like that. That'll work. Hello, hi. Right off the bat, we got a tiny leak here, not super concerning, but we do have smoke coming from the back firewall. Huh, this is uh. Yeah, that's gonna blow off. All right, I put some zip ties around this for a better seal, and now hopefully we'll be able to keep the pressure on the intake manifold, there he is. Yeah, we got a decent, oh wow. We got a decent amount of smoke coming from that brake booster hose, and it looks like it's right at the connection. All right, so that's quite literally a smoking gun boost leak right there. I don't like that at all. No brake issues though. The brake pedal didn't feel hard. There was no vacuum leaks or anything that I was having, but, uh, Okay, that's something we gotta fix. This is probably the original vacuum hose and they don't clamp them. So I'm gonna replace this and clamp everything. Not really much of a leak once you move it around a little bit, but yeah, I think uh, our main leak really is right back here. Well, let's fix it. So here's what I found. See that O-ring in there? It is rock hard and just leaking. I was able to find a universal O-ring just from my O-ring kit. And so I dug that one out. We're just gonna go ahead and fit this one into the groove. That feels good. Perfect, there's our new O-ring. All right, and then in order for anything to really work, you gotta do a little MB sunroof grease. This thing is getting low, guys. It's getting very, very low. We have this little red retainer clip to push in like that. And then we can push this back on, should clip in. There we go. Okay, all right, we're back. Let's retest. We need more smoke. Okay, we got a decent amount of smoke going on here. Let's fill the glove. There we go, rise up. Love. I've let this sit for a couple of minutes and we do not have any more leak from that hose. So that is fixed. And I tightened up the hose clamp right there. So 
we are leak free at this point. Let's go for a ride and see if we have any more boost. I don't think that was a big enough leak to cause any issues, but you never know. I have my super professional boost gauge taped to the hood. Let's see what we get. Okay, yeah, boost is just very kind of inconsistent and wavy. It did touch 20 there, but yeah, we got to mess with the boost controller in the tune. I think that's going to be part of the issue. So anyway, we fixed that leak. I don't know if it was actually causing any issues, but uh, it's, it's better now, so, so that's good. And the idea here is to have minimal issues on the dyno. Now, I do suspect we'll be able to raise the boost in the tune, but... I just want to double check that our wastegate rod is moving and this is the best way to see it with the boroscope and it's positioned very, very carefully. Now I have my shop air connected with a T and a boost gauge because I don't want to just overload these wastegates with like 150 PSI. So we're going to go up to hopefully about 10 and see this rod move. Here we go. All right. Now we let off. And... It yeah, it'll bleed right back. Okay, this side is moving great. So just wanna watch that happen. Perfect, okay, good. And it looks like it's starting to move right around. Yeah, yeah, right around 10, 12 PSI, something like that, which is normal. It probably has a 10 or 12 PSI spring. And then typically with a boost controller, which this has a factory boost controller, uh, you can double the amount of spring rate for you know the actual amount of boost that goes into the engine. So we should be able to make 20-ish PSI, which is what the car was designed for, and maybe a tad bit more, we'll see. All right, here is the passenger side wastegate rod. There we go. And we'll watch it bleed right back. Perfect. That is moving nicely too. We are good in the world of uh, wastegate. There is a little nut and you could technically adjust these. Well, <laughs> it'd be very difficult to adjust with everything put together, but these are factory set and they are new. So I'm just gonna leave them alone. Oh no, oh no. The red light is on now. That means this thing could be leaking fluid and lowering and it kind of does actually feel lower. Great. Great. Well, if you saw my latest channel update, then you know why I am at my home garage with the CL. You also have an update on all of my other projects. And I asked for $1 million for the space van, $1 million for the space van, and then sold it for just a little bit less than that. I'll leave a link down below. But if you didn't catch that video, here's what happened after driving my car home while I was in the middle of doing all the work that you guys just saw. Okay, 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 okay. Oh, it's coming from right there. All right, all right, all right. okay. You guys wanna see something crazy? I pulled out the hose and look at, look what we have going on here. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, it completely just busted. That's that. I definitely have to replace that one. And I thought at first that I might have to drop the subframe, but it, it might not be that bad. So yeah, a hydraulic hose that I replaced three years ago with one from Mercedes-Benz failed yet again, and it's out of warranty. So I just had to buy another one for $250. This was probably like $100 three years ago. I should have bought two of them. But anyway, that blew up. We got to replace it. Oh, this is just great. Well, after taking the air box off thinking I would have access, I, I don't. Those two pipes right there that get bolted in from the bottom, that's what I need to get to. But there is a frame right here just to give you some context. I cannot get my hand in at all. This is super fun. Here it is from the bottom. This is the hose we need to replace. This part right here goes up to the pump. And it's, you know, you just, it's just right in there. That's it. That's it. Oh, maybe we can go from this side. Oh no, there's a subframe. I just can't recommend a car like this, guys. I mean, you just, you gotta know what you're getting yourself into. They are very difficult to work on and they break a lot. That's why this was $180,000 in 2005 and I got it for 10 grand. This is why. Well, not that this is gonna give me much room, but we have to take off the old hose at some point. And it's kind of broken, you know, in half right now, so let's get it out of here. I can just hear the Grand National laughing right now. <laughs> I'm so basic, I never break and I'm, Really, really good looking. Yes, yes you are, Grand National, yes. Okay, I think I might have just gotten lucky here, Luck, sort of. Luckily, the air conditioning on the CL broke last summer when it was like 100 degrees out, it just stopped working. That was awesome. But what's great is I think if I get this AC line off, it'll give me room to get to those guys. And I already fit my little ball socket on here. So because there's no refrigerant in it, I, I can just take the line off, right? Right, that'll work. 
Ooh, put that on so tight. Well, it didn't break yet. Had to get a little creative here. Let's hope this works though. Okay. I think it's turning. Totally normal. Okay. Whoo! I got it. It took about 30 minutes because you only get one chance at this. If you destroy this bolt, it's never coming out, but it worked. Yeah, let's get this AC line out of the way and hope that helps. Okay, really know where to go with it, but yeah, get out. Okay, that's good. I can touch the bolt. It's like right where this finger is. Hello. But there is a black metal pipe right in front of it. Cool. I'm gonna get this AVC valve off of the pump and see if that shines some light on the situation. There's another tiny little screw on the bottom that I just got out and just have the one on the top now. All right, I'm hoping we don't lose too much fluid. Okay, not too bad. There we go. This was a part that I thought had failed during the original diagnosis of the suspension, but it didn't. It's good, these pretty much never fail. Oh man, guys, I got a socket on the bolt. It's so hard to show you, but it, it is on there. Took me like literally 10 minutes just to get it on there with the ratchet. Oh, let's hope this doesn't just slip off. Oh, I think I got it. Oh, ow. All right, I hurt my wrist, but totally, totally worth it. I think that bolt spun and that is fantastic because that black pipe is a nightmare to try and remove. And you guys wanna know something weird about me? Uh, sometimes when I'm doing a project like this and I have to get a really difficult part off, I don't go to the bathroom, like I have to pee, and I don't go until I know I'm gonna get that off. It's like a reward to myself or something, and it motivates me to get it off. So I, I really gotta go to the bathroom right now, but until that's off, I'm not going. It just wouldn't be as nice to go now. I, I need it off. All right, I'm twisting it right now with my fingers. <sighs> it's a great sign. Oh, this is in such a bad spot. This is gonna be horrible to get back in, but We'll let future Alex deal with that right now. Just got to get this bolt out. Come on now. My hand is asleep. Oh, oh, he, get out. Don't fall. Ah. Uh. <sighs> yes, the bolt is out. The bolt is out. I can go to the bathroom now. Oh, wait, no, hang on. I want to get this line out. Let's get the line out. More motivation. I really got to go. Here we are. One of these is the one we need to replace. Don't actually really know from this angle which one it is. All right. All right, I had to move some things around down below to get this line to come out the top like that. So good news is that this is out. The bad news is that it was only kind of easy to remove because it's pretty short. Now I have to try and feed this really big line in. And yes, this does dead end right here. That is totally normal. This is called a pulsation dampener line. And it's kind of funny because you get it right out of the bag and it's already wet with hydraulic fluid. It basically comes pre-leaking. I'm, I'm just kidding. They, they do oil this up though, I think maybe so parts of it don't rust, but kind of funny, kind of funny. All right, I'm gonna go to the bathroom and then we'll try and get that bad boy back in. It's a family channel, so I won't, you know, be bringing you with me. All right, I'm back. Uh, let's get this line in. That, by the way, took, I don't know, I think about two and a half hours to get off. So, ah, uh, yeah. This is like roughly gonna be like a five, maybe six hour job if we don't run into issues. Great. This will be really tough for me to show you guys how I do this. I actually don't even really know how I'm gonna do this. This has to fit inside of the subframe, but uh, yeah, it's gonna be a lot of stuff like this and a lot of, I hate this car, get in there. And then it'll be in. Kind of sounded very Mortal Kombat y right there. Finish him. All right, I'm probably gonna jinx myself here, but that was actually really easy. It took me like five minutes to weasel this thing in there, or finagle, as I like to say. So that's there. The bottom hose goes there. Now I have to, well, you know, finagle the bolt in from the bottom. That's gonna be tough, but it's nothing I can't handle. And comment down below who is your favorite Mortal Kombat? character. I love that game. I used to have a Mortal Kombat 3 Ultimate Arcade in my condo when I used to live in downtown Chicago. I was a very childish adult. Still am. Uh, Scorpion, he's my guy. I mean, you hook him with the little rope thing, pull him in, it's over. Uppercut, bam. You just do that over and over again. Do you guys see that? See that green guy? Right? Okay, right where my shadow is? 
that was about to ruin my day. That fell out of this bottom line. Had it gone like another half inch, I would have never known. I would have reinstalled the bolt, started the car, and it would have sprayed fluid everywhere. I mean, come on, CL65, give me a break just once. All right, guys, it only took me 30 minutes, but I got this bolt started. It's very difficult to get both of those lines and the banjo bolt in there, but I got it and I'm just going a little, little bit. Okay. And it fell off. That'll take me a minute to reset. Anyway, I told myself if I got that bolt threaded and tight in 30 minutes, I'm going to drop and do 20 push-ups because although that's going to be difficult, this is way, way, way more difficult. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do the push-ups. I, I don't know, guys. I just, I come up with weird stuff and I just do it. One, two, 99, 100. Oh, I could barely lift my right arm because I did so many. I'm just kidding. That was 19 and 20. I did it. I got the bolt tightened up. We're looking really good. Let me show you. Well, actually, I really can't show you anything. It's, it's basically impossible. But here is the line. I just have a couple of brackets and a nut to put on right there. But it's all coming together. This one fits really nicely in this channel, which was a pain to get back in. But, uh, but yeah, ABC hydraulic line is done and rightfully in the original legit street quarters because, you know, this is where everything has happened with this. Well, not everything. Just the first couple of years of disaster. All right, everything is wrapped up here, mounted to the subframe, tucked away where no one can see it. All right, let's go back up top. There's our AC line. And of course, I'm tightening everything by hand. Definitely not torquing any of this. That's that's impossible. All right, this guy is going back in place now, right into the ABC pump. Everything up top is complete. And now it's time for this very affordable hydraulic fluid. Drink up CL once, once again. You know, if you wanted a flush, you could have just asked. All right, fire in the hole. All right, we are looking good. No leaks down there and no leaks on the ground. I'll lower the car down. Oh yeah, it's pretty slammed. Yeah, we just gotta give it one of the, oh. <laughs> It just raised up, sweet. Now we'll raise it up some more. We are good, no red light on. And look at how high up this thing can get. This is in its highest position. And for a fluid check, we will lower this and raise it a few times. You can kind of see if you watch like the mirror or something. Okay, that's all the way down. Go up. Okay, all right, you guys can't really experience that. It's going up and down. As much trouble as it's been, I gotta say this V12 is just smooth as glass. These run beautifully. And I did use the factory Mercedes hydraulic filled motor mounts because I just, I want to keep the whole experience where you don't feel this car or this engine running at all. But anyway, uh, that is not leaking. Nothing leaking on the ground. I'll wrap everything back up and then we'll drive it to the shop and, and keep going. We have to pull out all 24 spark plugs next, I'll explain. On the highway, everything is looking good. No warning lights on, Distronic cruise control activated. We are good for now, for now. I'm, I'm not jinxing myself this time. I'm knocking on the real Mercedes wood even too. We're good for now. Well, that was fun, but we're back here with a car with no ABC hydraulic leaks. Uh, I've already started to pull up the intercoolers again, and we are gonna remove the charge pipes here off of the turbos because we need to get the coil packs off and then all 24 spark plugs. I've already re-gapped these. This was actually, I think it was literally the first thing that I thought was the issue with this car was that the spark was being blown out. So like three videos ago, this is what I attacked first. But in speaking with the tuners, they wanna see a little bit of a tighter gap. So I had reduced this, I think to like 23 thousandths. They wanna see 20 thousandths. I know it's not a huge deal, but the breakup, the misfire and going into limp mode would only happen when we were at wide open throttle uh, for a few seconds at a higher RPM. And that's when it can be really sensitive to misfires. So that's essentially what's been going on right now is we have a computer system that is super sensitive to misfires. So we have to make sure that it's absolutely perfect. So we're gonna gap these things down yet again. Yeah, pull our gigantic plugs. Again, we'll talk about this a little later with the tuner, but basically we were getting slight misfires because, well, essentially the ignition system wasn't up to snuff because it was running a little bit too rich and there were torque limiters. There were so many things fighting against us. 
So they were able to lean it out and kind of mask the issue, but we do think the ignition system is a problem. Even though it's pulling clean right now, there's still a couple times where it'll go into limp if we go over and over again with making pulls. And yeah, it's just a little sensitive. We just gotta tighten these bad boys up just a tad. All right, these coils are pretty fragile. You don't wanna just pull from one end and hope for the best you can crack them. So it'll kind of just do a little shimmy at the middle too. All right, cool. Super expensive coil number one is out. How many red boots? Oh, great. The red boots are stuck on the plugs. That's always fun. Now we'll go around and pull these. When you do the spark plugs, you should replace these. I mean, not like every time, not when you just did the spark plugs. I'm saying like if you're doing them like every 50,000 miles or whatever the maintenance spec is, you should replace these little red boots. They can get hard and deteriorate. All right, let's see what these plugs look like. They have, I don't know, five, 600 miles on them and a ton of testing. The tuners, they, uh, they rip this thing quite a few times during their many, many hours of messing with it. And then all the testing that I did. So these plugs have been through a lot, but they should be good. Yeah, the porcelain's still white. I like them. Okay, all 24 spark plugs are out and ready for the gapping tool. So here is my setup. Let me show you guys this tool. It's really neat. Not sponsored at all. I'll leave a link down below. I think I just got it on Amazon. It's not expensive. So instead of taking a plug and beating it on something to change the gap and then having to reopen that up, um, you get this. And it's a very simple device. The spark plug rests in here and this clamps down. Now, something that I've learned to make this easier is let's say you're shooting for 20 thousandths, which is what, what we're going for here. I had them at about 23, 24 thousandths. You wanna take a feeler gauge that's smaller than that. In this case, I experimented and 14 thousandths seems to be the way to go. So then you slide it in like so, and then you simply crank it down and that's it. Once this is tight in there and you can't pull it out, that's it. Don't go anymore, you can destroy the spark plug. So. We're good there, we'll release. And now our 20 thousandths is a perfect fit. So you want this to slide in, but not to where you have to force it in there. And then you know you're right at your specification. So the factory gaps these at 27 thousandths. I tightened them up to 23, 24, and we're going to 20 in hopes that this, you know, just makes the car more consistent without having little tiny misfires in the upper RPM range that eventually put it in limp mode. That is the idea here. And now I have 23 more to go. 24 spark plugs going in. And if you guys are curious, I did not put anti-seize on these plugs because they're coated from NGK. A lot of people mention this whenever I do spark plugs, why didn't you put anti-seize? A lot of modern spark plugs call for no anti-seize at all because they are coated. So you gotta verify what kind of plugs you're using. We're good in this case. All right, that's good too. Something else, if you're reinstalling spark plugs, this little crush washer will be already crushed. So it's gonna require a lot less torque. And you can see they give you the torque instructions right on the box. So if you have a tapered spark plug, it's just 1 16th of a turn after it bottoms out. And then if you have the washer like we do, it's gonna be a half to two thirds turn on the first time. Now that they're crushed, it's way less than that. You kind of got to do it by feel, but I'd say it's probably like an eighth turn or a 16th of a turn, something like that. Everything's back together, guys. It is time to go to the dyno. My appointment's in a couple hours and yeah, it's like 45 minutes there. So I just want to make sure I have a little bit of time, but uh, here we go, guys. I am getting very, very nervous. All right, it's running good. It's running good. Super smooth V12 power right there. Come on, baby. You can do it. All right, guys, car is running really nice and smooth. Let's give it a little whack. Woo! Oh, that felt weird. Oh no, had the check engine light on. No, felt really, really fast in the check engine light. What, no, those days are over. I gotta pull over. Uh, it's misfiring. Jeez, what in the world? This thing was running great. Uh, check engine light and we have an ESP visit workshop. What? Let me shut this thing off. Started up again and now it's smooth. Oh guys, this is nuts. This is my life with this car. You gotta be kidding me right now. All we did was gap down the plugs just a little bit. That's it, that's all I did. And before it would shred, like with no issues. I mean, we got it to misfire a few times, but it was after really long pulls. This was not that long. I will say though, it felt 
like it kicked in a lot more than it was before. Almost like it's running more boost now. I don't know. I don't know. We're almost at the dyno. Let's just uh, let's get back into it with the tuner. This thing is just, it's never simple. Never. Here we are, Cannonball Garage. Wow, do they have some really fast cars here right now. E63 and the Cannonball World Record holder right there, Arnie's Audi. What do we got on the dyno? Ooh, a Porsche. Cool. Same story as usual, a bunch of misfires just all over the place. And look in the transmission, maximum engine torque sent. Okay. And ESP can communication. Hmm. All right, guys, so I just did a quick pull with the boost gauge, and now it goes to 21 pounds of boost roughly, and it gets up there right away. And the last time the tuners left this car, it was maxing out at 14 pounds. And all I've done is regap the plugs. So it is possible that we clear things up, we cleaned it up with the new plug gap, and now it's able to get its full boost and everything on this car communicates together. So the engine control module with the transmission control unit and the ESP for the traction control, they all talk to each other and we're getting those codes for a torque limit. There's a bunch of limiters in all of these modules. So now that we might have closer to full power, the whole car could be freaking out. This could be a good thing. Here we go. All right. We're calibrating the dyno right now. The wide band is in. And all we have to do here is hold it at 3000. It is done. Ladies and gentlemen, Miles, one part of the tuning twins. And we have Jake, the other half. <laughs> All right, so he's gonna do a quick second gear pull right now and just kind of get a feel for it. Uh, eventually, we'll get up to third. That second gear, it was way too fast in the hole, so we're gonna go to third gear now. Okay. It looks like it has some older runs on there. We gotta get those cleared off. So if you guys were around for the last CL65 video where it basically failed on the dyno, it made 280 and 320. Uh, we just made 443 on just a really quick 4,000 RPM run and 583 foot-pounds of torque at like 4,000 RPM. So that's that's good. All right, so here we go in third gear. Let's see what happens. It did the shutdown thing? So uh, we're gonna investigate that. We can only log so much at a time. It's like an archaic ECU for this age of Mercedes. You can log like four things at a time, otherwise you can't log literally anything. It's like tuning by Braille, basically. The ECU has just been the, the Achilles heel of this car. I mean, these guys, I think they have like probably eight hours into diving into this thing. Logging is horrible, just everything. It's just really finicky. That one did 449 and almost 600 foot-pounds. So Jake and Miles were able to verify that it did hit about 19 and a half PSI of boost and before it was just 14. So something has definitely, definitely changed. And it did also go into that limp mode. It cut out right there. That's why we weren't able to make a full pull. So they're going to make a revision to the tune right now. So right now, Jake is looking at our ignition timing. And this is a little goofy because it's measured after top dead center. Usually it's before. So we see negative numbers. So it's like, if you want to go up, you got to go down <laughs> more <laughs> negative to be before. It's yeah, so. it's just goofy stuff like that, you know? As if this wasn't complicated enough. I mean, it's essentially the matrix right now. We have that to deal with. I was just going to lower the boost target down a little bit because right before it cuts the wastegate to zero and then we lose all our boost, it has a pretty large deviation. Bear with the logging, it logs at like two hertz. So I'm just hoping that it's a, a boost deviation that's happening, but it's not throwing a code for it. So it's kind of like a lot of best guess tuning because we have so limited on the logging. I mean, as, I mean, as great as the logging is that we can get out of it, it's so limited because you can't log anything at a decent rate and we are limited to the values we can see. So we don't know what the deviation it thinks it is. And if it is over a threshold, we just have to, okay, well, there's a deviation there. We know it can make a little bit less boost to see if we can get a full pull out of it at lower boost. So right now it's flashing. I've disconnected the engine fan and hooked up a battery charger. It should be done soon. It takes about five minutes to flash even just a minor revision. And for those of you guys who are new, this is not all wheel drive. The dyno is, makes it look like the car's all wheel drive, but it's rear wheel drive. Like it went into boost, then it lowered, and then it went back into boost. 
lost a ton of horsepower on that one, about the same torque. All right, so you guys remember how I uh, just did all the spark plugs and gapped them? Well, I'm pulling at least one spark plug. We are getting a misfire only on cylinder seven on the dyno, which, you know, that stinks, but it's also really nice. It's like one of the first times we've had something kind of like cut and dry and point us in the right direction. So yeah, I'm gonna pull the plug and see what we see. All right, gigantic coil coming out. I got this done in like three minutes, needed gloves. Everything is really hot. All right, first plug on that cylinder coming out. Okay, let's just get the other one out and compare. So here are the plugs and I actually replaced two out of the 24 with new ones just because I had them and I just picked two of the dirtier ones and replaced those. So yeah, obviously the new plug looks new and then I, I don't know, I mean some of the plugs just looked like this but I'm gonna pick a, a better plug to replace this one and we'll see what happens. I saved the two other plugs that I pulled out because there's nothing wrong with them, you know? So I don't know, we'll just swap them. <laughs> All right, it's all back together. Uh, say a prayer, do something over there, people. I mean, hopefully this fixed it. Clear misfire on seven. I didn't like that plug. I don't know, I don't know. Okay. I think we should just make a full pull if you don't mind hitting the fan. Yeah. And we'll see what it does. Cool. All right. That's good news, guys. Good news. Oh, so it's okay. all third gear. All right, well, we got a full pull, but it, only 447, and the torque is just like super consistent. So that was with the boost way reduced, but it was clean. So, hell, yeah, moving in the right direction. Brandon McClare is pulling into the shop. All right, so no changes there. Uh, 464 horse, 603 foot pounds of torque, so that's good. How much boost was that one? So that was only 13 PSI, which was down from the 20 or 21 you're seeing earlier. And uh, we turned it down from the first run because we have seen the misfires just to try and diagnose. So that's good power for 13 PSI. Let's yeah. start inching some boost back into it and see what happens. Cool. Seven. Okay. On that pass, it I hit the kick down switch. That's why it, it, uh, it okay. lurched. Yeah, it hit down, went down the second gear, but it, it had already cut the cylinder off by then. Okay. So. All right. All right, guys, I have everything apart once again, and I am going to get rid of this new plug. It still looks way too new. I wonder if this is a dud plug and it's not even firing at all. So we're getting rid of that, and we're just going to go back in, if I could pick them up, with, uh, with two plugs that worked before just fine. And I'm gonna swap them with cylinder eight as well, you know, just, just for testing purposes. All right, so worst case scenario here, it stays at cylinder seven. That, that would not be good and potentially indicate an issue. Middle best scenario is it moves to cylinder eight and then we know we just have like spark plug issues, I guess. And then best case scenario is it just rips and works. So please, best case scenario. Here we go, here we go, no misfires yet. Please, no misfires, please. crossing his fingers during that run. And let's shut this up. I'm sorry it's so loud in here, guys. Lots of fans and stuff. Eh? Made a full pull, but shut down right at the end. No. It made more power, but it, and it, it didn't count misfires, though. Oh. It didn't count misfires, but 10. So now it says cylinder 10. No, no, it does not. It What's does going not. on? It's saying cylinder 10 now. you got to be kidding me. Well, I mean, we almost made 500 wheel, so that's nice. 650 foot-pounds of torque. That run, it did 688, which is crazy. But uh, yeah, okay. I threw the stock voltage transformer on, and 
That made no difference on that run. Still misfired, so that's not it. All the misfires are on that driver's side bank. But yeah, I mean, you think it's the coil, it's the whole thing, right? But I've been there. I mean, I've replaced these coils a couple of times. Chasing this issue down didn't make any difference, but that is obviously very suspect that we're getting random misfires on just one side. Good. Not misfiring right now. Hey, look at that. We broke 500 horsepower and 700 foot pounds of torque. That was by far our best run. This is a really cool part about being at Cannonball. Train runs right through it. It doesn't come very often, so it's not annoying or anything, but it's it's really neat to see a train like this, this close to you, right? Like literally right next to the dyno. This train is the only thing that's bringing me joy right now. Little baby steps, people. Only like another 150 more runs until we have what it should make. I think this car should make, you know, some definitely somewhere in the 600 wheel range. I, I don't even want to say it anymore. I just, I just wish it wouldn't break. They made another tune revision. We're just gonna give it one more rip, but I mean, we're like at least 100 wheel horsepower off. So, and this clearly, clearly something is wrong. A lot of cool cars here at Cannonball, though. I mean, look at this. This is insane. Less power. Yay. Yeah, they, they cut out. I let off before it could yeah. cut out. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think we're done. I uh, don't know what to say at this point. I will say this though. I wish I could go back in time and not regap the spark plugs again because the thing was fine. The tuning twins were out within the last like month and a half and I'd ripped this thing a bunch of times and so did they like all the way through third gear. Okay, and it wasn't doing any limp home mode stuff. It was on a lower boost setting, I'll, I'll say that, but I don't know. It's all on this bank though, which then that makes me think, okay, you didn't do anything wrong to the plugs. I mean, I've gapped plugs a million times. It just doesn't make any sense. Is there too much back pressure on this side? Are the cats the issue? I did run with no exhaust before, if you guys didn't know that from the previous videos and it made no difference, so no back pressure whatsoever. Obviously, I'm never gonna give up on this, but uh, I think I'm going to, uh, I'm just gonna put fresh plugs in it again and uh, maybe I'll send this coil in on the driver's side to get checked, maybe having it in and out so many times. I don't know, I'm obviously thinking out loud, but uh, yeah. yeah, this is what happened. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Subscribe and like and share. And uh, I don't know what the next video is gonna be on, guys. The Cobra's in a bunch of pieces. This is this. And I hope you guys have an awesome, awesome day. I will definitely see you in the next video. For, igni For a significant portion of my 30s, I have been trying to fix this. My CL... So what I... So I do want to, I do want to, <clears throat> no, that looks good, that's great. Video quality right here, let's, let's put this out. This will be the YouTube video. Look at that. I would have reinstalled the bolt and everything else. I would have started the car and it would have sprayed fluid everywhere. This thing, I mean, come on, dude, give me a break. I got it. It took 30 minutes. <clears throat> then my voice. I have my super, prof I have my super professional, I have my super professional boost gauge. And the idea, the idea here is to have as little, and the idea here is to have as few, as little as few problems. The idea here is to have the least amount of